so welcome everyone to um, this session. Uh, thanks to Maine Audubon and Sally Stockwell and Andy Schultz. Um, this session is about forestry for Maine birds. Um, this is always a popular topic. We've had these sessions at the conference and standalone outside of the conference, always very, very popular. So thank you guys so much for being here today and doing this via Zoom for us. Um, we have a big group of people signed up to join us today. And so we are asking everyone to keep your video off as well as of course, keeping yourself on mute. Um, questions today, we'll ask you to put those in the chat if you have questions while Sally and Andy are presenting. Um, if it seems like a critical question, like a clarification, I'll, I'll pop in and ask uh, for those answers while they're going, but otherwise we'll try to hold questions uh, for after their presentations. Um, what else did I wanna say? I wanted to say, I've known Sally a long time and my, my earliest memory of Sally is the very first conference workshop that I coordinated was a session on vernal pools with Sally and it was awesome. And um, it really, it was a great um, start for me. Uh, it was so easy to do with you, Sally, and it gave me confidence to go forward and do a lot of other conference sessions. So thank you for that. Um, and um, with that, I think I will turn it over to you guys. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you, Donna. And uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you all these years too, doing a fabulous job. And I welcome everybody on the Zoom meeting today. It's really great to see such enthusiasm for our program. And we're really excited to talk a little bit about um, forestry for our Forestry for Maine Birds program, but also a little bit about what's happening with birds and declining birds and climate change, how does climate change figure in here and kind of a uh, big picture. So I'm gonna start off by doing kind of an overview to um, what's special about our wildlife here in Maine, especially for those folks who are not from the state, you might be interested in this. And then I'm going to turn it over to Andy Schultz, who is our outreach forester with the Maine Forest Service and a partner on this project. He's going to run through a bunch of slides that specifically have to do with the Forestry for Maine Birds program. And then I'm going to wrap up with some um, summary slides and then we'll open it up for, for questions and conversation. So let me share my screen. Can you see? Let's see? We can see it, Sally, but it's in. There we go. I think it's popping up now. I can yeah, see but that's the, not uh, the first. Not that's the first not slide. The first slide. Sorry, I'm gonna have to go way back up. <laughs> I clicked on the first slide, but it didn't pop up when I started. So uh, there we go. Finicky. There we go. Thank you. And are you are you seeing the full screen? Yes, we are. Looks beautiful. Very good. Thank you. All right. So as I mentioned, Andy and I are going to team up to do this presentation for you. And we're going to be talking about forest for Maine birds, but also a little bit about climate change, wildlife, and forest management. So I want to start by just noting that Maine wildlife and habitat is really special. And one of the reasons it's so special is because Maine is an ecological transition zone. We, if you go from the southern part of Maine to the northern part of Maine, we cross over as many different ecological zones as occurs from Central Europe to the very northern part of Europe. So if you comp compare the, the climate gradient, that's just three degrees of latitude in Maine corresponds with over 20 degrees of latitude in Europe. And that distance is about twice the length of California. 
So we have a lot of variety packed in to a relatively small space. And as a result, we have quite an array of different wildlife species that live and make their home here in Maine. Everything from 33,000 invertebrates to 23 reptiles and over 400 different bird species. And then in addition to those more commonly known species, we have lots of plants and phytoplankton, fungi, macrophytes. And, and so our job here is to try to create great habitat for all these different species. In addition, Maine sits at a very important place in the broader landscape. So you'll note um, this, this is a slide that the, came from the Wildlife Conservation Society where they were looking at what we call the human footprint. And this is a relative uh, example of how much human disturbance there is on the landscape. And you'll see the lightest colors here represent the least amount of human imprint. So much of Maine, more, as for those of you who are familiar with the Northern North Woods and also much of Down East Maine, there's, there's relatively little human activity in those areas. And this is kind of unique in most of the Eastern United States. And also the blue arrows designate some really important travel corridors that exist between the other New England states and Maine and then Maine and Quebec and New Brunswick. So those are important corridors for wildlife and plants to be moving back and forth across the landscape. Another way to look at the uniqueness of Maine is from outer space. And if you look at the number of lights that you can see from the outer atmosphere, Maine really stands out as having that very large dark hole where there are very few lights and in fact just recently, the um, <clears throat> Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument was designated as an official dark sky location. There are only a few of them in the United States and Maine has, um, is now in that, in that family. So there are other places further west, you know, that share that kind of dark sky, but very few places in the east other than Maine. All of this means that we have a unique set of wildlife in the state. We are the only state in the East that still has a full complement of all these different predators, everything from weasels to foxes to lynx to coyotes. And, um, and the reason we have all of these different species is because there's enough habitat for them. A lot of these species move around quite a bit. They use, uh, Bobcats, for example, each bobcat needs about 6,000 acres of land for their home range. So a lot of these, these animals are moving across the landscape. They need to move to find places to nest or, or den, places to feed, places to hide from predator, other predators. And so they, they, we have a lot of that habitat available here for these species. We also have the last stronghold in the US for the Eastern brook trout. All of those green areas mark relatively intact watersheds and stream systems where we still have wild brook trout that are doing well and that is unlike anywhere else in the Eastern United States. We have over 50% of the nation's remaining wild population about 97% of all the lake and pond populations and our streams uh, are with the most percentage of intact streams of anywhere in the Eastern US. Again, this is a reflection of the relatively low human imprint on the area. So now getting to birds, we also have about 90 different bird species that breed in our forest here in Maine. And this is a, a great map that was put together by National Audubon where they, it's a, a few years old now, but <clears throat> where they looked at where are the last remaining blocks of forest in the Eastern US along the Atlantic Flyway. And what jumps out immediately here, right? You know, that big green area in Maine. 
is the largest single area in all of the eastern US. And because of that, because of the importance of this area, the National Audubon and the Bird Conservation Society designated this large area in northwestern Maine as a globally significant important bird area. Important bird areas are areas where there are either large concentrations of one or two species or large concentrations of many different species. And in this case, it's the large concentration of many different species that come here to breed in Maine every year. So let's talk a little bit now about current and future wildlife trends. In 2019, the Canadians came out with this wonderful report called the State of Canada's Birds. And if you look at the graph on the right there, you'll see that they have divided up or they've looked at different groups of birds and what's been happening to those birds over the past 40, 50 years. And um, there are success stories here. If you look at the top two lines, you'll see that both waterfowl and raptors have actually increased their population since the 1970s. This is largely due to two reasons. In the case of raptors, it's because we banned DDT. And so things like bald eagles and osprey have been able to recover. And in the case of waterfowl, it's because there have been active groups like Ducks Unlimited and others who have really focused on protecting the nesting habitat of these species. But most of the other species groups are either holding, holding steady or slightly declining or declining dramatically. And if you look at those groups that are declining dramatically, the, the biggest problem is with our aerial insectivores. These are birds that feed on insects while they're flying through the air. But, and not far behind that, our shorebirds and grassland birds, and then our forest birds are, are sort of doing okay. But this is Canada, right? So the picture looks a little bit different in the United States similar, but a little bit different. There was a study that came out in 2019 in science that looked at 50 years of breeding bird survey data and then a lot of other long-term data sets. There were, I think, 13 different data sets that they looked at. And based on an analysis of all of that data, they were able to determine that between 1970 and 2017, we've lost nearly a third of our birds. So 3 billion birds that have, are no longer around compared with previous numbers. That's a huge decline. Many of us who have spent time out in the field, whether just as a, a amateur bird watcher or a professional working in this field have noticed this decline in numbers over the years. But seeing this report come out just really, unfortunately, you know, solidified the feeling among many of us that there just aren't as many birds as there used to be. And it's true. When we look at the different groups and how that declines are happening, we'll see in the case of, this is across North America, grassland birds have declined the most. But what we're focused on here today are primarily our boreal birds, forest birds, and our eastern forest birds. And although th those declines are not as dramatic as grassland birds, you're still seeing a 33% decline in our boreal forest birds. These are birds that tend to nest at the northern part of Maine and up into Canada. And then, you know, 17% decline in our eastern forest birds, which is all the birds along the eastern Atlantic flyway. And one of the reasons we think this is happening is because we're also seeing some dramatic insect declines. And many of our birds, particularly birds right now that are nesting and raising young, feed on caterpillars. And those are a super important protein pill for their young birds. But there's lots of other flying insects that, that our aerial insectivores feed on. And yeah, probably many of you have Phoebes in your yards right now. You know, they're out collecting insects. And so 
we don't know for sure what the situation here in Maine is, but we do know from studies that have been done elsewhere that there are dramatic insect declines. In Germany, there was a study that looked at flying insects in protected areas in Germany over 27 year time period and they saw a 75% decline in the number of insects. And likewise in, in our similar problem is in Puerto Rico, they've been able to document challenges between when insects are coming out and when the animals that are feeding on those insects are also trying to feed on those. And so this asynchronous situation has caused problems in a number of cases. So let's take a little bit deeper dive into our forest birds. Um, for our Eastern forest birds, we've seen a 17% overall decline in numbers, but also those declines have happened in at least 64% of the different species that are breeding in our forests. And that translates to a loss of 167 million birds. You can't even really get your head around what that <laughs> number means, right? And then our boreal forest birds, we've seen this 33% decline. Over 50%, 50% of species are showing that decline. And we're talking about a loss of over 500 million birds. So to put that in a little bit different context, this means that one out of every four of our Eastern forest birds and one out of every three of our boreal forest birds that used to be here in the 1970s coloring our forests with their flashy feathers and cheerful songs are no longer with us. That's a big loss. They're still here, but there's just not as many of them. So let's take a little look at um, some of these boreal birds that, are, that do nest here in Maine. This is just sort of a snapshot to show you what these birds look like. We have black pole warblers, bay-breasted warblers, rusty blackbirds. Rusty blackbirds have seen about a 90% decline in their populations in the last 10 to 15 years. Big nails thrush are um, a species of special concern because there are very few of them. They nest in our subalpine areas. Oriole chickadees, spruce grouse, are, are some other examples of our boreal birds. And there are people from all around the country and beyond who come to Maine specifically to hunt down and see these boreal birds. So another study that was done um, a, a number of years ago was by National Audubon. They produced this report called Survival by Degrees where they looked at bird species across North America and how climate change might affect their populations going forward. They used a fancy model that incorporated habitat values, temperatures, um, uh, where you currently find these animal, different species, and then where they might show up under different scenarios of warming. And I'm, I'm showing you here just a, a sample. They have all of this information is on their website. You can go and plug in Maine or whatever region you might be interested in. And you have an option of looking at what's likely to happen under different warming scenarios. A 1.5 degree Celsius warming, two degrees Celsius warming, or three degrees Celsius warming. And so what I've shown here as an example is for the Atlantic flyway, there are under a, a two degree Celsius warming scenario, they're proposing, they're suggesting that about 166 species are vulnerable to varying degrees from high vulnerable to moderately vulnerable to low vulnerability, compared with about 108 that will be relatively stable. So let's look at what that means for Maine. We're all, they're also predicting big changes for Maine. So during the summer breeding season, at a two degree Celsius warming situation. We've got about nine different species that they're saying are highly vulnerable, 75 moderately vulnerable, 46 low vulnerable, 57 stable. So we've got you know, over twice as many species that are likely to, to see shifts in their range or declines in their population as a result of 
climate change. We don't know exactly how this is gonna play out, but these are some predictions. And if we delve into that a little bit deeper, here are some predicted rain shifts for several different species. The palm warbler, which is a highly vulnerable species, this is, they're predicting that the range in Maine will essentially disappear. That's what this red color means. And then for the scarlet tanager, they're predicting that the range will be, so, will be um, somewhat maintained, but in cases where it might be shifting a little bit, the green are areas where it'll be improving slightly, the yellow are areas where it's either stable or worsening. And so we might see some shifts from north to south there. Red-eyed vireo, low vulnerability, it's probably gonna still be around pretty much everywhere where we have it today. And here's a, an example of um, a wood thrush range prediction to shift from the current range being all throughout the Eastern US to a 1.5 degree scenario where the red areas are starting to lose their habitat. The blue areas are places where they're starting to gain habitat. And then under a three degree Celsius warming, you'll see even more shifts further north and loss, extensive loss of habitat in much of the southern part of the country. So that, that you know, means that our forest bird life and other wildlife could be changing dramatically over time. We're also seeing new species move into the state. So we know that this is already happening. We know that bird shifts are happening. We don't know exactly how they're gonna play out, but here's a good example, red-bellied woodpeckers. I don't know about you folks, but when I was first um, doing my research, field research in the 19, early 1980s, we never had red-bellied woodpeckers in Maine, but now they've been creeping up slowly from the Southern states. And in 2010, they started moving into Maine and now they've really moved out throughout the southern part of the state and creeping up the coast. We see them quite a bit more regularly. This is true for other species as well. Tufted titmouse are more common. Um, we're seeing bluebirds that stay all winter long. That never used to happen. So we're, we are definitely seeing shifts. Another study I'd like to draw your attention to is one that I participated in along with other members of the Beginning with Habitat program, where we, we did sort of an expert review of all the different species in Maine, well, 442 different species in Maine. And based on what we know about their habitat needs, what do we, which ones do we think are gonna be most vulnerable and why? So it turns out that we think about 37% of them are highly vulnerable and 38% are moderately vulnerable. The habitats that are most at risk include things like alpine areas, montane or mountain forests, peatlands, northern river shores, spruce flats, and cedar lowlands. A lot of the, this has to do with the varying um, climate conditions at in mountainous areas and then also changes in hydrology. And then of, of all the different species that we see at risk, a number of them are sort of iconic main species and things like the moose, I'm probably many of you have heard, we have a winter tick problem that has been escalating for moose over the last few years. Winter ticks have always been around but with warming temperatures, they're able to survive through our, our warmer winters. And it, in many cases, they're causing severe uh, mortality among the young, in especially, but even among the older moose. So moose are now becoming more vulnerable to the warmer weather. We have loons that are struggling with heat when they're on their nest, getting overheated, getting more biting, black flies and other insects torturing them and new parasites and other diseases that they are suffering that they ne never used to occur in this part of the state. Atlantic salmon and brook trout both need cool, cold waters 
and we're starting to see some changes in our waterways uh, that could affect their longevity uh, over the next several decades. And in 2012, we had an unusual situation. Atlantic puffin couldn't find the long, narrow fish that they typically feed to their young. And so they were out collecting these fat little sand days that they were bringing back and the nests were littered with these fish, but the chicks were starving to death because the chicks couldn't eat these fat. They couldn't swallow the fat to fish. And we think that is a consequence. That was a year when, when the Gulf of Maine was particularly warm. So there was, there's, there's all these complicating factors that are coming into play for our different wildlife species. And um, fortunately, much of Maine is likely to remain still really good habitat for our brook trout, but it's probably gonna be, not only do we have most of the Eastern population here in the state already, but the conditions are hopefully going to persist to provide good habitat for them into the future. But warmer summer temperatures, there's more stress. They, they're having to look for really, um, cold water, deep pockets of cold water where they can hold over for the summer and until the rains come in the fall. So what are Maine Audubon and partners doing to help forest birds and other wildlife? Here's where we get to the heart of the, the talk today where we're gonna be talking about our Forestry for Maine Birds program. I think some of you in the, who are participating here already know a little bit about this but we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper and I'm going to turn this over to Andy now. And he's gonna walk us through these slides, but, but he's gonna to have to tell me when he wants me to move forward. So Andy, take it away. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Sally. Is everybody hearing me okay? You sound Andy, good, uh, Andy. Okay, great. Um, just briefly before I start going through the slides, I, I think I would like to just say why Maine Forest Service and particularly myself uh, have become a partner with Maine Audubon, the Forest Stewards Guild and others to, to develop this program and bring it out there. Um, in Maine, we have a fairly unique situation. Uh, as Sally pointed out, we've got a lot of forest land, but high, high percentage of it is privately owned, which makes it a little different from other states. So really the key to uh, maintaining or improving this forest habitat for these forest birds uh, lies with uh, working with private landowners. Now, my particular uh, title as landowner outreach forester, my audience are what we call family woodland owners. Uh, say they've got between 10 and a thousand acres. So that, that's not even counting the large landowners up north or in the, in the eastern and far western parts of the state. Nonetheless, there's round numbers, 80,000 of those um, family woodland owners in Maine, and they own somewhere in the vicinity of, uh, I think it's uh, around 5 million acres now, based on the last, um, and, and these are woodlots averaging 50 to 60 acres a piece. So there's a key there to both the birds and also why people own their woods. Um, the vast majority of, of these family woodland owners, when they fill out a survey, why they own their woods, what they value about their woods, wildlife is right up there. And even within the realm of wildlife, songbirds is very important. So you have, why do people want their woods and what do birds need from woods? And that gives us an opportunity to engage landowners in their woods to recognize uh, the habitat that they own, protect, steward, what have you, and to offer them some steps they can take to maintain um, so we don't lose anymore and even enhance so that we can maybe make up for some of the losses that are already occurring. So that's my commercial for the Maine Forest Service. Our Be Woods Wise program is our outreach program and you might uh, have heard of that. Um, there could be more questions on that later. All right, and of course, and of course, Andy, one of the um, landowners that we're also really keen on working with are the land trusts because land trusts own a lot of forest land in Maine as well. Absolutely. And, um, yeah. So and they're, happy to have you here. Yeah, there. Um, some some of the land trusts have large lots, but a lot of those are relatively small too. So every little bit helps. 
Uh, here is a really nice uh, drawing. Um, Sally can mention who put this together, but it really just pulls together so many of the elements of this program in one place. And I, I think these are available, aren't they, from Maine Audubon? Yes, we have. Um, we there's a copy of this on our website, and we also could send folks a, a smaller version. It's actually the the real version. The mural was created by Jada Fitch, a student, uh, previous student of Maine College of Art, and she does remarkable work. But anyway, um, it's a four by six foot. Yeah mural yeah. that's up at our Fields Pond Nature Center, but we have a smaller version available online. So yeah, this this kind of all in one place, it shows you some of those flyways. Um, a lot of the birds that we're talking about are, uh, they migrate, they're not here all winter. Um, there's some incredible stories about the stamina of some of those birds or the ones you see some of those flyways, they get out over the open water, uh, you know, for, hours and days at a time without landing. Um, when they get to Maine, what they want to really do is eat and make more babies. And that's a uh, baby bird. So that's the value of, of the Northeast and Maine in particular. Uh, and that's why this program focuses on that. Uh, next slide. And, and just one other note on here, when you see those, each of the different birds that are shown uses a different type of forest and a different place in the forest. So that gives you a quick quick view of there's a lot of variety out there. Yes. Um, why birds? Well, why not? I mean, <laughs> uh, from, for speaking for myself, birds really, uh, particularly this time of year, they really put a voice to the forest. And um, it's, it's just a, an increasing joy to hear those birds understand you know, who they are why they are where they are, and they indicate things about your woods that you may not otherwise notice. Um, the bird's eye view of your forest is a, is a great way to look at it. Um, and of course, birds in some ways represent other species, the, the whole idea of the focus species, and that I believe is a, a next slide maybe. Uh, perhaps not, but at any rate, uh, what we do to help birds will help uh, a variety of species too, because they all sort of work together. So here's one of those declining species, the Canada warbler. Um, the you know the kind of story is there, and Sally's kind of gone over some of this before. Uh, although w amongst all that red, where is where is the green and the the nut? The, the lighter, a lot of that is in, is in Maine. Next slide. For the project, and this is, this is where I was thinking we had our sort of focus species. There's far more than 20 uh, you know, of these bird species using the woods of Maine, but these 20 uh, taken as a whole kind of represent all the different parts of the forest, um, sometimes multiple parts that these different birds use and need to, to thrive. Uh, so each one of these represents other bird species and, and other, um, other wildlife species, really. Uh, we kind of break this up into four forest types, generally speaking, and eight different habitat features. And as we move ahead, we'll look at those a little more closely. I think next slide will show yeah, our uh, four um, broad types of forest here in Maine, at least for this purpose, we refer to the northern softwoods, the northern hardwoods, the northern mixed woods, and the oak pine um, types. So in northern softwood, priority birds include black-throated green warblers, black-backed woodpeckers, the northern parula, the boreal chickadee, uh, flycatchers, bay-breasted warblers. This is probably a good time for me to say that I'm a forester who's learning to bird rather than a birder who's learning the forest. So if some of these uh, names don't roll off my tongue all that easily, it's I'm getting there. <laughs> Next slide. And, and the key is that, you know, each of these different species kind of uses a different 
part of that forest, a different place in the forest, different features, habitat features in the forest. And one reason that the, the typing is done is it has a lot to do with the species that are there too. So um, northern softwoods, spruces, uh, uh, fir, tamarack, um, some white pine, uh, you know, the particular um, attributes that they have, these birds need. It could be for cover, for nesting, for feeding. Um, those insects that they eat are very often insects that eat trees, which, you know, we don't want to have too many insects eat too many trees, but a little balance is good. And if that keeps the bird population alive, you know, we can we can sacrifice a few trees to a few insects just to keep the birds going. Okay. And the northern mixed woods, and by mixed wood, we do a, mean a mixture of the softwoods, the, which another way to look at those is the conifer, the needle bearing trees, and then the hardwoods, uh, otherwise sometimes referred to as deciduous or broadleaf. So when you have a mixed type, and we have a lot of that in Maine, these species here um, are particularly adapted to that, the black-throated blue warbler, which I, I think I can identify that one by sound, maybe. Uh, Yellow-bellied sapsucker, magnolia warbler, black Bernian warbler, and the Canada warbler, uh, representative of that type. Next, northern hardwoods. Um, that's a very prevalent, not only in the northern part of the state, but in the west, and there's pockets of it here in the uh, mid coast and southern. That's, that would be your maple, beech, and birch types, and yellow bellied sapsuckers, eastern wood peewees, veery, and chestnut sided warblers. Um, they all use parts or all of that type of uh, forest. Next. And the oak pine, which um, I'm sitting here in Augusta, I'll say that the predominant type in this part of the state is oak pine. Uh, so tanagers, scarlet tanagers, wood thrushes, oven birds, uh, northern flickers. Um, these, these are quite commonly found in the woods around this part of Maine. Next. Here's a quick look at the um, you know, all the merch, so to speak. Uh, there's uh, three different versions of uh, guidebooks. Uh, you'll see on the right, the Forestry for Maine Birds. That's the Forester's Guide. That has the most detail in it. Um, gets really, you know, to say it's down in the weeds, you know, in forestry, that's where, you know, the weeds are forestry or forestry is all about getting in the weeds. So for foresters, other professionals and landowners that really want to do a deep dive, the Forestry for Maine Birds um, Forester's Guide is great. The On the left, the Woodland Owner's Guide is, um, a little more broad brush, but it captures all the high points. Uh, and if you just wanted to, an introduction to the process uh, or to the program, that would be your best bet. Um, and we've gotten a lot of those distributed out through our, our district foresters. Something else I wanted to mention in the commercial that Maine Forest Service has 10 district foresters across the state. They can come visit woodland owners and talk about their woods with them. And uh, if or when ha uh, wildlife habitat is high on their list, our, our folks can talk about that too. Although we may want to refer to actual wildlife uh, biologists at times. Uh, the smaller guide in the middle um, was designed for loggers because when we talk about actually managing a woods, uh, foresters come up with the plans, but most of the time it's a logger that makes them happen. So uh, over the past several years, the loggers in Maine through the certified logging program and other outlets uh, have all become at least familiar with this. So that if a logger is talking to a landowner and the landowner expresses interest in habitat, particularly in bird habitat, the logger is not clueless. The logger knows what, or you know, many loggers will understand. And uh, it's um, a two-way street uh, communication about outcomes when you're doing harvesting is very important. And last but not least, the, the wonderful trading cards, which nobody actually trades because they're too nice. Everyone keeps them. Um, these are available through Audubon. And also um, we've got a little supply at the Maine Forest Service uh, that we can pass out as well. Um, all of the, uh, well, the three pamphlets I think are all available on the Maine Audubon website. 
Uh, you can also purchase the uh, Parsers Guidebook. Uh, I believe I'm correct on that. Um, for those of you who want it, uh, one way to get a hold of the pamphlet or the bird cards, as I mentioned, is call your main Forest Service District Forester. <laughs> okay, next. Yeah, and I'll just say that the um, the logging guide, other states have not, who have similar programs to Forestry for Maine Birds, have not necessarily connected with the loggers. And I just got a call this spring from one of the major logging groups in the state that said, hey, can we get some more copies of that logging guide? They're very popular among our members. So they've requested another, another 500 copies. And uh, Maine Forest Service did help us reprint some of these materials. So we do have a bunch at Maine Audubon too. Yep, okay. So broadly speaking, um, one of the goals of the program is to get a variety of, of forest types, not just uh, based on species, but based on some things we'll talk about more such as the the diversity of species, the diversity of age, the structural diversity of the forest. Again, we'll get into this. Uh, this all contributes to an overall wildlife diversity. Um, one of the goals is more of the mature, uneven aged um, type of forest stand. Um, again, I just want to say birds don't necessarily worry about how old the trees are, but they look at things like size, height, where the canopy is. And to, to get some of those attributes, you do need to have some older forests. So we'll talk about that as we continue. I guess we can move, move on. Um, this is, uh, if we were able to do this in the field, this would be kind of the, the best part of the whole show is what we call the handy forest habitat assessment. Um, an assessment sort of maybe not quite as detailed as an inventory, but is taking stock of what you have in a particular woods and you walk around and you stop here and there and you look at what we call the visible acre. Um, so it's not just where you stop facing ahead. The, the, the trick here is to stop and turn around 360 degrees and look at that part of the woods. And then using your hands, I don't know if anyone's seeing me on the screen, probably not, but that's why this, um, there, Sally is demonstrating. And this, uh, this uh, poster here also demonstrates these items. So to, to briefly explain the items that you would be looking for at any spot that you were assessing, on your left hand, the left hand represents the living items, generally speaking. So it talks about the trees that are there and where they are, and by the way, water. The right hand, I don't like to call them dead things. I just call them the things that aren't alive right now. Uh, <laughs> and um, so for instance, snags, uh, the WM in this uh, graphic stands for woody material. Um, and we sort of divide that into coarse and fine. And sometimes you go a little further and you say coarse, medium and fine. But these are the parts of the trees that are no longer um, photosynthesizing, they're in the process of decaying or, um, you know, breaking down. And they do contribute habitat um, in, in a number of ways. Uh, leaf litter is uh, also important. And that's, in most cases, um, I see the leaves or needles, uh, particularly important for nesting habitat for certain birds that we'll get into. Getting back over to the left hand living things, the really the, the three in both cases, your center three fingers are, are the, real, the real deal. Uh, the three on the left hand refer to overstory, midstory, and understory. And those are sort of specific vertical height um, segments. Understory meaning ground to about six feet. Midstory is six feet to 30 feet. And overstory is anything over 30 feet. I think the next slide shows actual people in the woods, trying to figure out how many fingers on each hand and what they mean. And you see that they're working with those core three on each. Um, and really, if, you know, if you're sort of just starting out doing this, if you get those three on each hand right, you're gonna cover a lot of what, what 
birds are looking for the way you know the birds view bird's eye view of the woods so i think we can uh move ahead unless you want to add anything sally okay just no, I don't want to add anything, but I'm having trouble getting the, the slide to move ahead now. Okay. Well, uh, just while she's doing that, this is from an actual Forestry for Maine Birds uh, workshop. I believe this, this particular one was held up in, uh, in Bradley um, at the... Uh, where the Leonard's Mill Logging Museum is. There we go. So this is referring to, again, the four broad types, OP for oak, pine, NS for northern softwood, NH for northern hardwood, MW for mixed wood. Uh, this picture, I would say, is a northern hardwood stand, um, fairly typical in the, I said, the Western mountains and here and there all over the state. And uh, some of our, you know, most beautiful recreational opportunities are in those areas. And also, uh, there are valuable trees there from the timber standpoint. So a lot of uh, forest management is about balancing different values, uh, different priorities for different landowners. Um, one of the things that you might ask a forester to do uh, is to prepare some sort of a plan for a woodlot. And part of what they are going to be measuring anyway has to do with the forest type, the age, and the size, and the height of the trees. A lot of that goes into uh, the inventory of tree timber value. Um, with a little tweaking, it's also an inventory of habitat. Uh, next slide. Here's a, a graphic, again, sort of showing what I was talking about. Those three vertical layers uh, referred to as overstory, midstory, and understory. Uh, and this is starting to relate the different um, species that need, um, at least partly, they need these parts of the forest, either for their feeding, for their breeding, uh, nesting, cover, what have you. Um, if you look at the understory, the oven bird, which uh, we were talking earlier, uh, I mentioned yesterday, I was out in the woods and I heard a very loud oven bird and uh, somebody said, have you ever not heard a loud oven bird? They're, they're, they're quite distinctive once you recognize the sound. They nest on the ground. They need an understory. And particularly, they actually need that other finger, that, um, that leaf litter layer. However, where we heard the bird was up in the, probably in the midstory. So it's not just every bird in a silo a lot of these bird species need these multiple layers um, for different functions. So this is, gets back to that whole diversity thing. It's pretty difficult to have all of these things happen on one acre, but if you have even 10, 15, 20 acres, you do have the room to provide a certain variety of, um, of habitat. Uh, next slide. Um, standing deadwood, of course, you think uh, woodpeckers, obviously, uh, here's a pileated, I believe, our largest, uh, largest woodpecker in the state and probably in the eastern part of the country. And they're, they're a lot of fun to hear. They're a lot of fun to see. They do um, make large holes in snags. Uh, of course, they'll also go after some live trees, too. And that's, uh, that's a little strategy they have, I believe, to to attract some bugs. Um, so in some cases they create their own habitat, but uh, they also use uh, dead and dying trees quite a bit. And they create those large oval holes for nesting. Sometimes other species use that after pileated are done. So this is part of the value is dead wood, but it's part of a living forest. Next slide. Uh, roughed grouse, uh, one of the prominent users of the down material, particularly large logs. They need to get up on those and drum as part of their courtship and possibly, maybe they just do it for fun, I don't know. Uh, but at any rate, they need to do it. And having those uh, large pieces of wood, large logs decaying slowly on the forest floor, um, it helps 
that particular bird species. And I think the next slide will show that, again, other species use that large material on the ground as a travel way through the woods. It lets them move faster. Um, and uh, that's just how they've evolved. So what you do for birds is good for other species. That's an American Martin, if I'm not mistaken. That, that one's a Fisher. Sorry, Fisher? That's a Fisher. OK. <laughs> Looking for food underneath those big down logs, but also, as you say, traveling through the forest on them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next slide. Here is our oven bird. And when you get a close up look at the nest, you can see why it's called an oven bird, because it does look like an oven. Um, generally speaking, when, when people learn to recognize the call or the, the song, they, they use the uh, the little trick of uh, teacher, teacher, teacher. I personally prefer pizza, 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 because that helps me remember it as an oven bird. But either way, or whatever works for you when you're out in the woods and you hear that very distinct sound, you know that it's an oven bird. And if you're hearing oven birds, and there's a pretty good chance that there's an adequate leaf litter layer that they can nest in. So sometimes what the the presence of the bird, the presence of the bird tells you something about your woods. Um, not only does the woods tell you something about your wildlife, but it works both ways. So uh, the idea of the small gap, uh, this is referring to canopy gaps. And remember canopy, um, really overstory is what we're talking about, that 30 feet and up. And it's easy when you're walking around to just look at eye level and think that the opening that you're looking at is at the ground level. Well, for the birds that need the canopy gaps at 30 feet or higher, that's where the gap needs to be. So it's just um, a reminder that when you're doing these assessments to look up, you need to look around, but also look up. And uh, Many times the canopy gap is not as big as the opening on the ground. Um, when we talk about the size range of these gaps, we're usually in the vicinity of, oh, maybe as small as a tenth acre or quarter acre, up to no more than a two acre gap. And for a lot of woods around here, a two acre canopy gap feels pretty large. Um, in the scheme of things, there's not a, a giant opening in the woods, but on a small woodlot that can seem pretty big. Um, another thing to consider is that if you're trying to get an understory established, that zero to six foot layer, most of the time you need some light to reach the forest floor. So the canopy gap um, can also lead to creation of the understory, which eventually grows up to be a midstory. So this is kind of getting at some management decisions that can be made based upon what you have and what you think is missing that you want to sort of bring along slowly. Next slide. Uh, on the other end of the sort of spectrum, the mature forest, the late successional is another way to look at it. Um, some of us will use that term rather than old growth, because old growth can kind of mean different things to different people. But the idea of the older forest with the larger trees and by the way, that's how you get larger material on the forest floor is that trees have grown old and either died, been blown over, in some cases cut, um, and maybe partly removed, but not entirely. And when we're talking about large trees and late successional, we, we really kind of start that conversation at around 16 inch diameter trees, uh, not just one, but many of them. Um, and also there's a few other attributes of late successional. Uh, but of course, when you hear or see a late successional bird, the bird's telling you something. Anyway, this is a picture of Sally measuring a 37 inch diameter hemlock tree. That's, that's a pretty good size hemlock tree. Um, we do have some of those around, uh, but they'll tend to be in those stands that have had less, uh, less activity. So sometimes the decision is not whether you manage, but how you manage. And leaving some of these bigger, older trees can be very beneficial for a number of things, uh, which are mentioned below. Uh, the carbon, maybe just back it up real quick. 
Uh, these help with climate resilience. They are legacies of, uh, you know, for you know, both the genetic material, uh, there are seed sources to help fill in those gaps. And of course, they're holding on to more carbon. Okay, now next slide. The riparian areas and wetland forests are also very important. Uh, we, you know, do a lot of work, uh, we meaning Maine Forest Service, at, at protecting water quality through our best management practices uh, program and the booklet that goes with it. So while we're protecting water quality, we're leaving buffers or we're managing the buffers along streams and ponds and lakes differently, leaving more cover, which by the way, helps uh, maintain those temperatures that um, cooler temperatures longer that Sally was mentioning for brook trout. Uh, there's just all sorts of benefits to protecting the water, not the least of which is that clean water is a primary ingredient in good beer. But that's another slideshow. So let's move on. Okay, so this, this graphic is kind of, again, to look at a particular scene in the woods and to pick out those, um, those habitat elements. Um, another way to look at them is a structural, you know, if you're sort of in it, have the ecological lens, you talk about structure. If you have the, uh, the habitat lens, you talk about, uh, well, also structure, but things like the overstory, understory, etc. So I think if you hit, so with this, this slide, the more vigorous upper canopy trees, uh, scarlet tanager um, need those. Now that arrow is pointing to a canopy gap. You can kind of see it as back a ways from where the camera is, but you know you see a little more light coming in. And I want to say that is a flycatcher. It's the eastern wood peewee, which is a flycatcher. Yeah. Yes. There you go. And um, once you recognize their call and see where they are, you can. It, it 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 really works. I can just think of an aha moment I had when I heard it. And I suddenly realized I was sitting there right on the edge of a forest canopy gap where a couple large trees had uh, blown down. Um, they need to sort of hide on the edges, fly out, catch their insects and fly back. So this is, a, I guess, a forest version of those um, the aerial insectivores, um, sort of a, more specific than the ones that are in decline. I think our Eastern wood peewees are doing okay at the moment. Yes. And, and the thing about all these species that are doing okay, uh, you know, let's not ignore them. We want them to continue doing okay. Uh, we don't want them to get onto that, you know, worrying the list of birds to worry about. So, you know, if we keep doing what we're doing and, and do more of it, we'll, we'll keep those guys in good shape. So the denser mid story, you can kind of see that 30 foot there is a uh, thrush. Yes, a, wood thrush. That's the wood thrush, um, which uh, is, it's a little bit odd, but it's easier to find a hermit thrush than a wood thrush. I, I would have named them the other way around, but you know, that's just me. Anyway, uh, snags and cavities, um, they're gonna be beneficial to woodpeckers in particular. Uh, I think next one, yeah, the denser understory. That would be our black throated blue. You got it, Andy. Oh, I see. I'm better than I thought I was. They, and, they especially love hobble bush. Uh, yeah. Now, many of us who walk through the woods do not love hobble bush, but it helps <laughs> to know <laughs> that somebody does. Uh, that's that's pretty particularly, and I think northern hardwoods is where I've come across the most of it. Yes. And then that ground cover layer again, the leaf litter. I think we're going to see the oven bird. Okay. And then the down and dead wood. And that is the rough grouse? Yes. Okay. So again, it's just another, another way to help you identify these different parts of the forest. And when you're sort of taking inventory or doing the assessment, determining what do you have, what, what's missing. Uh, the, with forestry for Maine birds, there's kind of this, uh, you know, 
idealized goal, or it's not maybe idealized, but this is what we're hoping to get a distribution of young, intermediate, older, and mature forests. Um, right now, around this part of the state, we really have a lot of the intermediate and beginning to be older. A lot of this is still coming back from reversion from alcohol, uh, <laughs> agriculture. I uh, seem to have something else on my mind for some reason, uh, but reverting from uh, agricultural lands, we have a lot of intermediate aged and sized stands, and we're actually lacking a, still a bit on the young forest, and we're particularly lacking on mature, uh, simply because these stands have not been around long enough to produce the large trees and the attributes of a late successional stand. Um, I think next slide would be good. Or Maybe not. Back, just back it up one more. I mean, just you, you notice at the bottom there that the um, there's kind of a relation between tree size and age. Obviously, it takes a while for a tree to get large. Sometimes you can be fooled, though. You can have old trees that, for various reasons, have not gotten large. And as I mentioned before, birds are really looking at the physical attributes. So, age relates to these attributes, but my suggestion is don't get hung up necessarily on age. If you have trees in the right size and height uh, canopy categories, then that's what the birds want. So now next. And, and I'll just I'll just throw in there that um, while we have a lot of intermediate age forests here, it, particularly in the southern part of the state, there are ways to create more set of those older forest characteristics. And that's what we're really trying to get at through the, one of the things we're trying to get at through this program, which the last slide really illustrated, you know, can you do things in terms of your active management to create those gaps that simulate natural disturbance of trees, for older trees falling down? Can you do something to open up an area where you get more diverse layers of vegetation and that, that sort of thing. Can you create snags? You can kind of fool fool the system. Well, you can work with it and you yes. can nudge it along sometimes. Um, we foresters uh, realize that we don't really make the trees grow. They, they do that on their own, but we like to nudge them a little bit one way or the other uh, for all the reasons that people own woods. So uh, this is referring to a few of the more specific outreach programs that have been around for a while. Um, Maine Audubon has taken the lead on a project in Western Maine. Uh, it was called uh, uh, My Maine Woods. And now they, they're working on an area in the lower Kennebec River watershed um, where, and maybe Sally, you wanna jump back in with a little bit about that. Sure. So um, we, we've been working with landowners both in Western Maine and in Central Maine to try to encourage them to create wildlife friendly management plans and then of course to implement those plans after those plans are written but to work with a forester to create a wildlife friendly management plan and if you're interested in doing that and willing to do that we do have some funding available in this case for particularly for the Kennebec area some funding up front to help folks get started on that process. And so this is just a screenshot of one of the informational brochures that's on our website. You can go look at that if you're interested and, and or give me a call or shoot me an email later on. Be happy to talk with you about it. We have June 30th is our deadline for getting folks enrolled and we still have quite a bit of money to, that we could hand out. So if you're interested, get in touch. Yep, get in touch directly with Maine Audubon for that particular program. Not sure what number slide we're at. Uh, moving ahead, the, oh yes. Um, I think part of uh, outreach here is getting some signage up in, in what we call demonstration forests. This one is at the Yankee Woodlot in Skowhegan. Uh, anybody within striking distance of that uh, woodlot, it, it, it's, a great, it's a great place to walk around. Um, it's been a demonstration forest, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 years. Um, they're in the process of, of creating uh, new, new signage and um, 
new interpretive trails. And as part of that, these really lovely looking forestry for Maine birds um, signs are going up to help people connect what we're talking about in the slideshow with an actual location. Uh, I want to say that, uh, that also at the Yankee Woodlot, they're doing something called picture post where they're taking pictures from the same point of view over time, which shows you that slow or sometimes not so slow uh, change in the forest. Uh, there was recently some harvesting done there. So uh, they've created a few gaps and they've also got some places where they're nudging it towards that mature um, forest situation. So it's a, it's a great place to visit and walk around and it's a collabor collaborative effort. The land's owned by the state of Maine. Maine Forest Service helps with the management, but the Somerset County Soil and Water Conservation District is really the sort of the caretakers there. And they're the ones working on a lot of the educational material there. And, and we do have also have signs up at the Sewell Woods in Bath and the Hidden Valley Nature Center in Jefferson and the Woodbury Bird Sanctuary in, um, in Litchfield. So check them out, go visit them. Yeah, all those places are open to the public and welcoming of visitors. So coming soon, Forest for Fish. So this is the trailer, right, for that the right. next movie. <laughs> right, so there was a program that was started in Michigan called Forest for Fish. And um, we were very excited to learn about it. Both Andy and I learned about it at a conference we were at a few years ago. And we are bringing that program here to Maine. And it's going to be complementary to our Forestry for Maine Birds program. It's we already talk about the importance of waterways and riparian habitat, but we wanted to draw a little bit more attention. So we're working on some new outreach materials for this as well, because what happens in the forest really affects what happens in the water, whether it's vernal pools, streams, ponds, lakes, you name it, and all the critters that live there. And again, one of the things that makes Maine relatively unique in the country and even in the Northeast is the amount of good clean water that we have. And the reason for that is we have a lot of forest land that filters rainwater and, and slows it down and lets it percolate through and, um, you know, part of our yes, and effort. It, and okay. some of our water districts are also really taking note of that. Um, so Andy and I have been working with the Portland Water District, for example, on some forest management to enhance that, to, well, to keep that water really good quality primary right. source of drinking water for about 250,000 people in the state. Yeah, and that's referring to Sebago Lake, by the way, which yes. does Thank have you. Uh, quite a, you know, the, the, if you think of that area, it um, kind of overlaps some of the bird uh, priority areas, but it's a uh, high priority for water quality. So I just have a few summary slides I'm gonna go through now to kind of pull things together, um, which is shifting back to the big picture here, strategies for how to conserve wildlife and habitat. And, and those of you who've been involved in the land trust community are maybe familiar with these already, but it, if not, it'll be a little um, primer for you. So one of the things that we are really thinking about when we think about not just the forestry for Maine birds on, a, on the individual property, but how does that fit into the bigger picture here? And uh, how does that fit into the bigger picture of the work of land trusts and other and state agencies that are involved in larger landscape scale conservation? Well, one of the things that we wanna do is just pay attention to where are what we call the climate strongholds, those places where there's the likelihood that no matter what happens with changes in our climate, we know that there's that those will continue to be places of high biodiversity, high geographic diversity, and therefore support lots of different plant and animal species. So on the map out on the left there, the dark green areas are places that are considered climate strongholds. Again, you can see how Maine really jumps out there. And the map on the right is a more detailed map that was created by the Nature Conservancy that looks at sort of um, climate resilient areas and again, Maine really, this is Western Maine in particular, jumps out as being really key areas. And what are the characteristics of those climate uh, resilient areas? Well, one is 
that you have a really diverse landscape. So you have mountains, lakes, rivers, wetlands, um, and forests, of course. <laughs> and if we keep all of that intact, even though the particular species might change over time, the, 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 the plants and animals who reside there will still do well. And so regardless of, of whether um, boreal chickadees are still here in the state, something else will take its place in the future. And so we wanna keep that habitat in good shape so we can make more baby birds. And uh, likewise, we really wanna make sure that we're, that we're maintaining that high quality water that we have right now that not only supports people who love to fish, but and the fish that are in the rivers, but mink that are feeding on the fish and the wood thrushes that are singing from the trees, et, et cetera. And one of the key things that we need to do with our waterways is reconnect them. And probably some of you have been introduced to the Stream Smart program, Maine Audubon, Maine Forest Service and others are deeply involved in a program to reconnect our streams, many of which have been pinched or otherwise dammed and limited with limited movement of both water and aquatic organisms up and down the stream. So we want to try to improve that along the way. And um, as we've talked about in a number of, of cases, part of what we're missing on the landscape are these more diverse mature forest stands. And so working with what we have in hand and forest silvicultural techniques, we can enhance some of those habitats or as Andy said, sort of push them along in, in directions that we are interested in. And finally, just a note that, you know, management and then how you conduct your, your management or your operations really matter. And so thinking about um, not only what you wanna accomplish in the, your forest land, but how you're going about doing that is really important to work with, work with a forester, work with your logger, and try to create the best habitat that you can. So with that, um, I'm gonna stop there and we can, uh, if you're interested in more information, we have lots more information on our website, the Forestry for Maine Bird website at mainaudubon.org. And we have materials that we can get to you if you want so some hard copies of materials or get them through your district forester and if you have follow-up questions, you can contact either me or Andy. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and see if we have any questions from folks. Yeah, we do. We have a few questions, so I'll let you, there we go. We can see you better now. Um, we had a couple questions that had to do with insects um, because you mentioned uh, back in your, presentation, Sally, that there's been a big decline in insect populations that's affecting birds. Do we know what's causing that decline in insects? Well, we know some of the answers to that. So I'm sure many of you have heard about monarch butterfly declines, for example, you know, dramatic declines. And one of the reasons for that is because farmers used to leave the little sort of rows of, of weeds really in between their plowed areas and the edges of their fields or the waterways or whatever. But a lot of that has disappeared over time as more and more of those areas have been plowed under. So that, that you know, loss of habitat is one reason. And another reason for sure are some of the pesticides we're using, for example, neonicotinoids have been shown to be particularly devastating for things like bees. And there have been situations where I know there were some studies done up in Canada that were able to actually document this, the presence of certain pesticides in bird tissue because of the food that they were, the insect food that they were eating. And so that may not necessarily kill the birds, but it might, it, it might cause behavioral changes or it might make them more susceptible to stress or disease or whatever it may be. So it's, you know, it's a combination of things and we don't fully understand the answers yet. We're actually doing a little bit of a 
uh, study here at Maine Audubon in conjunction with the Maine Entomological Society and some others where we're first of all, just trying to gather any data sets that are out there of long-term data sets that are tracking insect populations so we can get a sense of how are our insect populations doing here in Maine? Are they declining? Are we in trouble? What do we know? What don't we know? And what can we do about it? And there's, there's also some legislation pending right now this year that has to do with addressing some of these pesticide issues. Great, thank you. Um, and another just insect type question um, that I don't know, a lot of people might have, uh, ticks are so prevalent right now. Are there any birds that eat ticks? I don't know if you've heard this, but I certainly have heard, oh, you wanna get turkey, the turkeys are eating the ticks. But then I read something that was a little bit more um, believable that said, no, turkeys don't even have the ability to, they don't have the flexibility in their beaks to get at those little ticks. So I, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, I, I, except for guinea hens, that's the one uh -huh. thing. <laughs> but, but I do, I do have neighbors who've had guinea to hens who swear have seen them, you know. Yeah. But in terms of wild birds, I don't really, we don't really know. Yeah, yeah. Um, somebody has asked, what's the first step to get started in Woods Wise? Andy, you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and in fact, I that uh, question I did uh, offer something in the chat, but basically what I often say to people is walk in the woods with a forester is, is your next best step. Um, we at the Maine Forest Service, I mentioned before, we have district foresters. We have 10 of them that cover the state. Uh, there's a function on the website to type in the name of the town where your woodlot is, and it'll bring up the contact information for the local district forester. Um, also, you can contact me and I'll get you connected as I just did with a the person who was asking, or I hopefully did, um, and this is a this is a step where you know you can walk around, ask questions, uh, you know, get general answers, some broad suggestions. Uh, our district foresters are not going to come in and tell you what to do with your woods. They're going to try to help you make a, a good informed decision about what you um, can do, and a lot of it derives back to what is it that you're looking for. Um, so with habitat, there are certain things you can do, but of course, sometimes that depends on the type of wildlife habitat you're looking for. Um, the the follow-up question to how do you get started with Woodswise and you know meeting with your district forester, is there a cost for that? And the answer is no. We refer to that as a, it's a prepaid situation, your tax dollars at work. However, there are limits to what a district forester can provide. And at the end of that conversation, you may decide you need something like a forest management plan, that it would be helpful and beneficial uh, for managing your woods uh, or your habitat or whatever you want to, however you want to look at it. Uh, Sally alluded to some funds that they have to assist uh, with certain types of forest management plans. Maine Forest Service also has a program called the Woods Wise Incentives Program. Um, that can help with forest management plans. And the two programs are separate, but they're not mutually exclusive. So you can get a Woodswise plan. And as long as it covers uh, certain things about wildlife in it, um, and you're in the right part of the state for Sally's program, uh, you, can, you can get some additional help there. Our Woodswise program, I do want to emphasize, covers the entire state. So um, in a nutshell, that's, that's what Woodswise is. And there's also funding available through the Natural Resources Conservation Service. They have their own separate process for providing funds and um, helping support the, the development of a management plan and then also to pay for some of the activities following that plan. And if, you're, if you want more information about that, you can get in touch with us, you can get in touch with Andy, we can refer you over. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Those tips for funding are always much, much appreciated. Um, and a great question here from Caroline. Um, there are lots of stands of even edged pole size stands in Southern Maine that were clear cut in the, in the past. 
what's the best strategy for them? Andy, well, I just- <laughs> Okay, you waiting for me? Yes. Um, and I see it in the chat now, and the question was pre-commercial thinning. My, my go-to answer on these types of questions is it depends. So this is really where I think you want to, rather than me just say, yes, absolutely, do a thinning. It kind of depends what kind of trees are there, um, the site they're growing on. In some cases, on sites where trees don't grow fast, the thinning may not really boost the growth very much. But on other sites, by thinning, reducing the amount of competition, the trees that remain will get bigger faster. Um, they'll get taller sooner. They'll add diameter and crown. And crown is very important for, well, for the trees uh, and also as a habitat feature. And a lot of those insects are up there feeding on leaves and that's what the birds want to eat. So. Um, Again, I would say, you know, a pole size stand says to me that it's, it's in that intermediate age class. It's not the early successional, it's not the later. Another thing that probably I didn't mention or I should have with forestry for Maine birds is this landscape idea. Obviously when it's your woods, that's all you can really do anything about, but you can look around or the professionals you work with can look around as much as like the 2,500 acres surrounding your area. And what is there a lot of and what is there not much of? And if for whatever reason you're in an area with a lot of, um, well, we know in general, we're gonna have a lot of those um, intermediate size and age stands. Is there also a lot of early successional habitat already happening from other harvesting or reverting agriculture? In which case you might wanna make the decision to thin with the idea of getting your biggest trees to get even bigger sooner. And you're working towards that um, mature forest situation. Uh, on the other hand, if for some reason you're surrounded by a lot of relatively mature woods and what's missing are those gaps or the early successional, you may choose to uh, have some of that happen. The other thing that you have to understand is the types of trees you have. Not every species of tree will grow to be 100, 200, 300 years old that you want in a, eventually in a late successional stand. So you have to temper your expectations to what you have. And that's why it depends. And that's why really walking with a forester is so many times that's the next best step. And Andy, Andy will tell you this, I've been in the field with Andy and other foresters all looking at the same site and trying to figure out, okay, what do we have here? What do we want? How do we get there? And Andy will always say, well, it depends. And he will always say, if there are three, if there are two foresters looking at the same site, you'll get four different answers. So it, there's, there's no one answer. There's no one way to do this, but I will, I, uh, as a non-forester, I can tell you that um, it's, it's helpful to talk to more than one forester to get different perspectives and to figure out who, who you wanna work with. Do you click in terms of personality? Do you click in terms of goals? And the more clear you can be about what your goals are for the management of your property, the more helpful the forester can be. And, the, and just to get back a little bit towards that, um the question about the pole size stands, depending on how many acres you have to work with, some of those pole size stands can be managed towards late successional, but maybe other parts of them, and again, it can depend on the species that are there, might be a place where something on the early successional or the gap side is what you wanna go for. And we haven't really talked about the timber value, but even for people whose place wildlife high above timber income on their list of goals. My experience is that money never doesn't matter. So knowing the value of the trees you're working with can help with the decisions as to what to cut, when to cut. Um, markets change a lot and they can change across the state. Generally speaking, working with a forester, you can bring in that timber value side to help inform your decision, not necessarily to drive it totally, but to know what you're working with. 
Awesome. Well, that's a lot of great information. Um, we're coming towards the end of our time here. Any last minute questions that somebody wants to pop into the chat while I'm saying goodbye? I'll just um, take a minute to thank both you, Sally, and you, Andy, for joining us today. That was great information, and um, I'm sure it's got us all thinking. A good time of year, too, to do this presentation because birds are really at top of mind right now. So thanks for making time to do that. Um, you've been great about inviting folks to be in touch if they have questions or need more information. Um, and we will be sending a recording of this out to everyone afterwards in case that's helpful. So get out there and enjoy the sun if you've got it today, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking time. And we will see you the next time. Bye, everyone. Yes, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And I, I hope that we've inspired you to get out there and, and take a fresh look at your woods. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. And Donna, thanks for hosting. Absolutely. <laughs> Our pleasure. I, I stuck my email into the chat. So if that makes it in the recording. That's a good way to get in touch. Yeah, with them. somebody asked about that. I believe that the chat, I think you can't copy out of the chat, but I think it's included in the recording. But I will definitely include your both your emails in that in that, you know, follow-up email where I share the link. All right. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thanks. Bye bye. 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 bye.